Uh, Jim, are you okay? Yeah, I don't know. Is the CIA going to get a copy of this or not? NSA surely will. But yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, Rick can fill you in on our other episodes. We've been having quite a good time. The topics have really been quite the range. So um, Rick just come, came up with a, a sh shooting in the dark, uh, false archaeology, true archaeology, What's that other name? I can't find it. We'll come up with a name, but uh, <laughs> eh, it's somewhere. Um, but Jim, doctor, welcome. No, I'm happy to be here. Can you see me and hear me? I, I can't see myself. Yeah, yes, you, I... you look great. Okay. And um, I mean, what an honor, doctor. I mean, you know, uh, you're kind of uh, not the normal uh doctor are you doctor why thank you <laughs> rick why don't you start us off with something i would like to introduce two friends of mine one of them is chris fanafrock who is uh pretty much acting as a technical brains for this outfit god help us all and the other one is dr james p shears who is a professor emeritus what exactly is your surveying engineering is that your exact Civil engineering, right. And Civil I, engineering. I taught in surveying and mapping when they still had a division there. And thank you for that. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with Dr. Shear's work, he has surveyed and mapped some, I'm, I'm guessing here, around 1,500 different mounds and earthworks. Is that in the neighborhood? That's probably about right. I would say a couple hundred sites from Wisconsin, Canada, uh, down to the south, all across where we could get to them. Well, thank you for that. That is far more than um, those two guys did back in the 1840s. And they, they got published by the Smithsonian for, oh, okay, one of them did. Uh, I'm talking about Squire and Davis in this particular instance. They, they mapped some 150, I think, and they were made famous for it. So you've exceeded that by roughly an order of magnitude and uh, we thank you for that and you also didn't keep any of the artifacts no, oh, I didn't, not we, very didn't many. Dig. we just surveyed and uh, i will say that we did get the attention and i was threatened with a lawsuit if i didn't remove the <clears throat> old world golden ratio geometry in one of our groups because the authorities <clears throat> weren't going to have that you know in that time yeah they yeah. still won't no, no, we, we've got to uh, have this invisible wall around this country to keep anybody out before Columbus. That's, if we could do time travel, we could solve a lot of these mysteries. But we'll have to do an episode about that, Chris. We will. Um, very good. Um, I, Jim, how sure are you of when you map some of these mounds, you know, and survey this, this very important art that uh, science i'm so sorry that needs to be continued and you have taught some students and they need to teach more students um the art of surveying um can you describe that to us and just you go to a site you measure it you map it and how certain are you of the golden ratio and other you know uh, old world measurements being found in american mounds how sure are you of that well, um, I was uh, actually just teaching bright foreign students who came to Wisconsin at that time for graduate work. Uh, and we were one of the best in the world at that time. And so to keep them busy, I had them survey Indian mounds rather than tombstones in the park by the most accurate method uh, available at the time. And that was by setting up in the middle and, and getting astronomical north by shooting a star, north star normally, but any star or the sun. And uh, then based on that, to survey the details in the mound group 
And uh, obviously that's what the ancients were doing as well because their maps showed that all these sites were laid off from true north. Now, in our work today, we can get true north to about a hundredth of a degree. And it looked like the ancients were able to get about a tenth of a degree, about a minute of arc, which is phenomenal. But uh, indeed, we found evidence that the ancients were still doing that in the early 1900s or keeping the, the uh, process alive in their secret lodges, the Potawatomi. So to answer your question, our surveys are routinely done to a, a hundredth of a degree and in distance to about an inch, but we back off from that because we can't find the edge of a mound better than about a, a foot. So we can cover a large area and then look at the relative position of mounds, effigy mounds or rocks. If a rock was placed on top of a mound as a fine marker. And we're, of course, accurate to that. And if our work is done adequately, uh, we're confident in that. So we get encoded in all these sites, true north, but only in one site is true north open. It's always encoded with an angle that you could easily make 60 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees. And so you have a large key alignment. And uh, if someone told you what the key alignment was and the key angle, then that could be laid out and people wouldn't have to do an all night observation of the stars to get true north. So encoding and secrecy is part of it. And of course, once you get into the into the uh, lodge traditions of the old world. You're reading Plato and his encoding of the extreme and the close, which is obviously talking about the golden ratio. That was a secret as it is still in a lot of ways to the Masonic lodges today that still exist. Well, the Native Americans, we find that the same thing. So then you go from one site to the other, and after about five or six sites, when you start to get the same geometry, you have confidence in the fact that it's not a uh, fluke, it was intentional. And uh, some of these sites will have up to a couple hundred mounds, and we have lots of sites, and then before the the mound groups, we had sites laid out with organized rocks, and we have the same blasted geometry, just expressed a different way. And by the way, after we found the golden ratio in the mounds up here, and uh, the authorities wanted to censor, but we wrote about it, uh, surveyors in Mexico found it there too, but we found it up here first, and so, it is a universal language. It's uh, in the Mayan calendar. It's in the calendar that the Greeks use for the Olympic games. Uh, it has to do with the pentagram, which uh, in our culture has been, has associated with the devil and uh, tore Venus out of the sky and sentenced him to, to hell where he is today. So, hmm. Been around. And um, why do you think there's such a concentration of mounds? And boy, my friend told me this the other day, just so many stories of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, you know, so many mounds up in that UP, Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, border of Canada. I mean, obviously there were so many in Ohio alone and down that way, but what was going up up there where you live that was, you know, was it the copper culture? Is that why or? Yes. Um, 
we of course have the uh, only collection, large collection of effigy mounds in the world in southern Wisconsin. And uh, up in the north, we have the only collection of prehistoric copper pits that were mined on an industrial scale, it appears. Thousands and tens of thousands of these prehistoric pits. And it was Fred Ridholm, now deceased, who was former mayor of Marquette and a science teacher who said, there's something missing up here. We've got all of these uh, prehistoric copper uh, pits and there's no adequate explanation. The explanation at that time was Indians came up there and, and dug out uh, some copper and put them in bags and carried them home to make fish hooks out of it. But that would probably account for a couple you know, hundred tons in the mounds, whereas it was estimated a quarter million tons of copper were taken out. Where'd the rest of it go? So then we get to, it would go trade-wise, and then we have to the Mississippi River, the Wisconsin River, coming through southern Wisconsin, and then in more recent time, connecting to the Ontonagon River, to the mines at Lake Superior. And we go back far enough, then <clears throat> the water levels were different. So larger ships could have gone up the Chicago Ship Canal from about 3000 to 1000 BC without any portaging <clears throat> right up to that area, loaded up and gone south. And before 3000 uh, out the St. Lawrence River, it looks like. So for a long, long time, people have been coming for copper. And uh, I think that's the explanation if the copper miners were up in that country where they have up to 10 feet of snow in the wintertime, you can understand why they'd want to get south to Wisconsin where you might have 10 inches. And uh, so we pick up these, <clears throat> some of the copper uh, burials in Wisconsin further south. So this area was a key area besides that in the uh, verbal histories from a uh, Menominee guy by the name of Pamita. He said that whole area in central Wisconsin was used for thousands of years as a place where copper was brought down for the commercial trading to ports further south. So I would say the reason is copper and uh, this is kind of a crossroads of the nation in the or the continent. If you look at the roads being only water in those days, and you have then where the uh, water from the Great Lakes connect to the water from the Mississippi and the Gulf, and up in the north, you can also go to Hudson Bay, and if you know where to go, you can go to the seas that lead to uh, China. Very good, Jim. Do you want to jump in with something, Rick? Sure. Um, you mentioned two key things about the entire copper trade. You mentioned Potawatomi, and you also mentioned various waterways that could carry the copper from the Great Lakes region into the Gulf region. From that discussion, we can go to Poverty Point and we have found, uh, when I say we, our general group of researchers has found adequate, in my opinion, evidence that copper was industrially processed at Poverty Point and probably a few other places along the way. But Poverty Point, where it is now 75 miles from the Gulf, was on the Gulf itself six or 7,000 years ago. Um, also, six or 7,000 years ago, as you mentioned, Jim, the water levels were vastly different. And a number of the various river systems that exist now as small tributaries were directly connected or directly connectors between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi Valley. I've researched uh, one of those pretty thoroughly, thanks in part to Potawatomi participation. Uh, Potawatomi have a casino in South Bend, Indiana, and at the entrance of their casino, 
and the restaurants there, they had large copper boulders because they believed they were an essential part of that trade at that time. Mm. And that the St. Joseph River, as it exists today, was part of that route and that they did not have to get out of their canoe to go from Lake Michigan to the Gulf of Mexico. And I think they're right. So Very that's good. where I am on that one. Now, you also mentioned that the old world had some pretty good numbers and number crunchers. One of those was a guy by the name of Hipparchus, and he instituted and drew a star map that was good to, uh, if I recall my research correctly, some one minute of arc or a little less in 1100 BC. Does that sound right to you? Yeah, these guys were just as smart as we, and if they had the tools and the know-how, and in many cases, just having a big, long pole gives you accuracy that we get today with real fine instruments. So yeah, sure. And I might say that uh, Pomita, a Menominee guy, who met us at one of our sites when we started the surveys, essentially unloaded uh, stuff on us uh, which would probably otherwise have been lost because his lodge is closed now. He said that we had traders just like you have traders today. And he said the Potawatomi were in every village there'd be a, <clears throat> some Potawatomis that have a trading setup. So that would reinforce what uh, you're saying there. And uh, I believe that the the casino up in the UP that we go to for our meetings, Escanaba is Potawatomi too. At least the Potawatomi have legends. And that whole thing seems to go way, way back. And uh, these legends are, are preserved in chant form different than kids in, the, in a uh, gymnasium passing word around if a chant is given and there's a word wrong, somebody, his, the teacher, the guy chanting will correct them. <laughs> so that's a little different than verbal legends that we would pass down from grandma to grandma, grandson. Yep, the, uh, the Potawatomi claim a, a very strong tie to ancient trade particularly with copper, but with other things as well. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, why, Jim, so the Ho-Chunks or the Winnebago's uh, up in your area basically controlled all of the Mississippi back in a good chunk of the ancient times, and they were the major group uh, controlling that river, but is that not as commonly known? Um, tell us about the Ho-Chunk. Well, you've got, like in any culture, you've got people who are the traders and people who are in political control, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then you have people arguing about the past. Uh, so I'm not sure all the whole chunk would know or agree, but I was uh, privileged to also know a whole chunk elder by the name of Preston Thompson, who just before he passed away and wanted me to come over and he gave me some more information. And so he was unloading stuff on me too, which some of which he may not have passed to his family members, but he thought for some reason we should know. He said that when Columbus came, the whole chunk were in control of the Mississippi River political control of the Mississippi River and its tributaries. And he says the language spoken by the Mandans of Missouri is the same as the Ho-Chunk, which is the same as the Sioux, the same as the Missouri, same as the Balak seat down at the mouth of the Mississippi. And then before the whites came in, they also were up the Ohio River uh, as well, uh, the language group. And he said that uh, they were in political control when the Columbus came and they got word that 
the uh, Columbus and his people were raising hell with the Indians and they had an obligation to do something about it. So they were enticed to raise an army of other tribes to go down and, uh, and to meet them. And that's where the stories of meeting the army of Ponce de Leon in Indiana near near as I can tell from his descriptions where they were paddling in the Wabashaw River and your paddle goes directly north. That's right where it happened. So his story was that they were in complete control of the Mississippi, political control, but they were the old timers and they had stories that go way back to the glacier, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that's a story that he told that he was in political control. And if we find Fine. a burial <laughs> ground where he said the battle took place down there near Rick's place, uh, so much better. If there's Spanish down there, you'd expect a certain amount of Spanish uh, armor or something at that site. And I understand uh, that Spanish armor has been found not too far away. Is it Angel Mounds as well? Yes. And, and yes, Angel Mounds. And also in one of the mounds, old mounds has disappeared now that was in St. Louis. Well, I would all fit because uh, the stories also are that the Ho Chunk had a capital, not where Cahokia is, but where it's St. Louis. And all those mounds got, uh, got destroyed. And, and the Ho-Chunks have stories of before two glaciers, right? That would put us at before 24,000 years ago. Is that the estimate? Well, uh, they've got stories of the glacier walking on the land and the animals that were at the foot of it that came every summer to feed long nose critters and so on. And uh, they've got stories of saber tooth tigers, they call them, and bears, short-faced bears, we call them, they call them long-armed bears. Uh, so they've, they say they've been around forever, but of course forever is your perception of what forever means. And uh, their neighbors call them the sea people. They call themselves Ho-Chunk, which seems to relate to prime voice or big voice. Or we talk about te teotonic uh, language, a Germanic language in Europe, the Germans preserved. Well, same thing seems with the Ho-Chunk with the name Ho-Chunk. Their neighbors called them Winnipegu, Kuans, various names, which all meant the same, people of the salt sea. And it was for that reason the Spanish or the French wanted desperately to get to the Ho-Chunk or Winnebago because they thought they could show them the route to the Northwest Passage, which is another story. And there really is one that the Indians can use if your boats aren't too big and you know when to squeeze through it. Way but south of the present one we use. So these water levels being different are such a major key to all of this and ups and downs and lefts yeah. and right. You know, here's a, uh, a sad commentary on our culture and where we're going up on top of a hill and on campus observatory hill, there was a big rock that had a plaque on it dedicated to Chamberlain, Professor Chamberlain, who is the one credited with actually walking the ancient water uh, beaches and coming up with the idea of isostatic rebound. When the mile high glacier melted, then the land started coming up like you're sitting on a pillow. Um, they, last week they moved his rock. And it was also part of an Indian long range alignment scheme that we knew about, published, gave the university uh, reports. 
And because somebody uh, called it a niggerhead, it got moved and is now gone. Hmm. And so many of these rocks that are precisely placed where they align to certain things all across the country and they get moved and it just destroys sites, doesn't it, Jim? Yes, yes. Yes, we have laws to protect uh, burials. Indian burial, if it's a proven burial, is now protected the same as if a white man were buried in a churchyard. But there's no laws on rocks. And uh, many of the earlier sites are all rocks. And uh, yeah, and they can be moved. They can move like, like under university, uh, Permission and authority, Chamberlain Rock, which was part of a long range alignment in the Indian tradition, got moved because somebody didn't like the name somebody called it. And, uh, you know, also roads get built directly through stone circles and those stone circles oh, yeah. align all across the country or perhaps overseas. Um, why do you, why are the mounds up in your neck of the woods, effigy mounds? Why, like animals, what type of animals are they? Like, what are they aligned to? Well, um, of course you've got the different clans and uh, one of the earlier surveyors that came through in the mid 1800s got to know a guy by the name of Dikuda, walked with him and told him about the effigy mounds. He says they're like writing in a white man's book and an educated Indian can read it, read the story like a white man can read a book. So there's a story obviously there and uh, the story has to do with animals, but the animals have different functions. Uh, the whole chunk in Nebraska say that uh, one of the historians said that the um, fish clan of the whole chunk were the engineers who laid out the effigy mounds in Southern Wisconsin. They didn't build them all, but laid them all out. So they, Fish were the engineers and architects. The bear were the government enforcers. And the um, chiefs were the Thunderbirds. And the tradition was still carried on till recently that if you're gonna have be a traditional chief, not necessarily one now for the casinos, but traditional chief, they had to come from the Thunderbird clan. So when you have an interplay with Thunderbirds and uh, bears, and then there's a panther there, uh, there's a story. And I wouldn't say that I can uh, read them, but I've been trying to for 20 years, decipher the message. And so that's part of it. Up in the North, and Beaver Island, you have rocks of certain shapes and you find a rock that looks like a wolf head. Well, I'll carry it up and we'll put it at this grave where John Wolf is buried. It's probably what was going on. So the language is in the rocks too. There may be laws to protect the mounds but there's no language in rocks. Hmm. And, and there's no law to protect the rocks. But jump in, Rick. I just, I'm lost in thought here. I've noticed, um, particularly along the Iowa Wisconsin border, there are a series of effigy mounds that have often almost universally been interpreted as bears, but they seem to be grabbing the tail of the one in front of them with a very long snout and that very reminiscent of a line of elephants. What do you think of that one, James? Well, I think the ones that you're referring to are the marching bears, uh, but further south, oh, right in that area, 
uh, where the Wisconsin River meets the Mississippi. T.H. Lewis, who got in trouble with the Smithsonian, mapped about uh, eight to 10 clearly elephant mounds. And uh, when we started our work, uh, I was lectured by a professor of archaeology saying, there are no elephant mounds. The Indians didn't know about elephants. So these are declassified. They've been destroyed. There's one still in existence, which I'd like to get up and uh, get some radar on it uh, to disprove the idea there were no elephant mounds. There were stories of elephants, and there's also right there is an area where there was a ford and native stories that the mastodons came off of the plains and crossed there and up the Wisconsin River to eat grass at the foot of the melting glacier. So uh, there, there are, there's one elephant mound that was uh, mapped in the 1800s and appear in one of the Smithsonian publications. But by God, there's no elephant mound, so it's been destroyed. So we come up with yeah. our belief, and if the data doesn't fit our beliefs, we have to destroy the data in some cases. So that's a sad commentary on people in the past. Yeah, sad. that seems to be pervasive, too. And all during that time, there are there are native yes. stories that go along with, uh, with uh, the elephants crossing there or the mastodons. And uh, Merlin Red Cloud past now said that they hunted their last mastodons up in Minnesota. As they started to be hunted out, they would have to go to Minnesota to get the mastodons across the same ford to get up. Well, we've we've uh, we've seen big whale mounds, Jim. Um, you know, of stone, right? Um, yes. Big snake mounds of stone, yes. many of them. Uh, speaking of water levels, the late David Hoffman's research is fabulous on water levels. Um, so let's see. Do you want to jump in with something, Rick, or you want me to go somewhere? I, you're leading this pack. Go for it. So tell us, Jim, about, um, well, really quickly, fingers in the sky. I've always wanted to remember this. So if you take your fingers like this, that is how far the moon should move in an hour. Is that right? <clears throat> well, um, depends on how long your arm is and how big your fingers are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of the things I did when I was teaching surveying to non-engineers was uh, to get across the idea of measuring and trig, have them all in one lab, uh, get their, calibrate their pace. In other words, you have a hundred feet and then you, you walk it and do it twice and get the mean and the, you know, the error. And the same thing with angles. So one angle that can be used uh, by anybody if they're calibrated is your full span. How far as you can reach at arm's length. And that's easily done by putting a rod against the wall and walking back and calculating. Uh, that's going to be different for different people, but that's going to be in the neighborhood of uh, 15 to 20 degrees. And then uh, you can go with a thumb width. That's going to be in a neighborhood of two degrees. So you always can, if you do that, you always got something you can work with. So you can estimate something like latitude on a boat without a sextant. And it's not gonna be so good, but it's gonna be, be there. Another thing you can use that the ancients obviously were using and we have completely forgotten about 
is that the diameter of the moon and the diameter of the sun are the same and they're one half a degree, one half a degree. So you can use your thumb and the moon and get real good, good angles. So the, with respect to a Southern pole or the Western horizon, the sun moves one hour angle an hour or 15 degrees an hour. So a good person uh, can estimate that and can get the time before sunset pretty accurately when it's getting really close and you can use your thumb or one degree every four minutes you got it it's, it's a clock in the sky we just it's still there we just have not been trained to look at it we've been trained not to more <laughs> or less yeah but it's still there and the ancients were using that as well. apparently and myron Payne's done did quite a bit of research on this the uh, Inuit and a few of the other far northern tribes that are lesser known used a device that they called a kamal, and it's usually carved from whalebone or walrus bone. And it had it had um, graduations carved into it so that you could judge the height of the sun from the horizon based on these graduations. Oh, yeah. in, the, in the far north, this becomes important because certain times of year, the sun never sets. So you, you're you not only judging the time, you're judging direction with some degree of accuracy with this very simple device. Right, right. So it's a, it, like a forerunner of the sextant. Yeah. Yes, it, it's a, a single degree of mobility sextant is what it is. Right, right. So Jim, can you tell us about the torquetum and your mm -hmm. discoveries with that about ancient China, knowing basically longitude, latitude. Can you tell us about how that was taught to the kids in China in, uh, you know, before Christ? Do you really want that? I've been working on it for, since we were at Beaver Island, I've got a rough draft of it, but I'm probably going to give you more details than, I, than you want because I'm too close to it. But basically, uh, what they call the torquetum is the same as we would call a motorized or a mount for a telescope. In other words, the spin axis of this quote crooked transit is aligned to the spin axis of the earth. With that, a lot of the equations that we wrestle with now, where we only measure horizontal and vertical angle, can be to get uh, true north and astronomy. It's all worked out mathematically by this simple device that the Chinese called the torquetum. Now, it's come down to us under different names besides the telescope mount. In the 1800s, surveyors in Wisconsin and Michigan, when they were laying out the townships, found that when they got in areas that are now well known to have iron ore, that their compasses were no good. In some cases, they were 60 degrees off. And I've seen places that will swing 10 degrees in the compass in 100 feet. So something had to be done. And uh, you can then do observations on the North Star, but you can't do that in the daytime. So a guy invented the Burton Solar Compass. And it was neat. It was an addition to the surveyor's compass. And all it was was a part of a torquetum. And as long as the sun was up, they get the altitude of the sun in the mid morning and mid afternoon, rotate the instrument and it's pointing to north. So he got a patent on it, but the Chinese were using it before the great fleet went out, 1430, long before Columbus, well, a couple of generations. 
And uh, the Canadian Air Force had the same problem with their planes up over Canada where the compass is no good. So they invented an astro compass, which I think you have seen. And you can get on the web, right? Yep. Our surplus. The same thing, it was just a Tarkaton. Uh, well, we uh, got some years ago as training aids for students trying to better visualize what the equations of spherical trig, which we say we have to have to do this kind of work, all mean. And uh, so I took out this instrument and we we're up at Beaver Island. I challenge everybody, the Chinese handled the longitude problem by determining what well, they didn't say they did, but when we look at their records, that's what they were doing. They would uh, find out what star was over their port city at Nanjing on, new, on uh, midnight of their new year. And that star happened to be what they called Song, which is got a name as well in our star charts. But of course, the next day, uh, it wouldn't be over there, the city, it'd be somewhere else and keep moving. But by finding, uh, say, on the coast of Africa, what star was over that port on the same night that an observer at Nanjing was observing Song, the difference in longitude on the star chart, the same as the difference of longitude on Earth. And it's so simple. And we've got then writings of star data and we don't know, can't make out <laughs> basically what they all mean, but they were handling the longitude problem apparently before Columbus. And then uh, we didn't solve it until Cook about 1800. But so, Tarkatom looks like it can be used for that. And so these centuries and centuries of saying that you had to have spherical trig in order to have longitude. And a chronometer. They knew yeah. this long ago. Yeah, when I, I was really a few people I could talk to on these matters. I go to my friends who teach navigation at uh, Naval ROTC or to my surveying buddies who teach spherical navigation or surveying, they, they, they have been well indoctrinated. Oh, you can't get longitude unless you have a chronometer and spherical trig. They don't say that spherical trig was invented by a, a guy called Al Burini who went to India and found that the people there had longitude on their on their maps and he didn't know how to do it so he tested to see and they wouldn't tell him so he tried to learn it and came up with spherical trig and then we say and we've been using it ever since yeah we say then that we have to have spherical trig to do longitude well you don't there's an it has to be an easier method because it's sure that the people in india before he got there weren't using his equations and right Simple. They're simple. And they were doing the same thing here, according to the Indian traditions with the long range alignments between signal hills. You mentioned Naval ROTC. The Naval Academy stopped teaching celestial navigation several years ago when they got so indoctrinated into GPS that they decided it couldn't be as good. And then somebody told them, you know, as soon as the Russians knock out our uh, satellites, then we won't have GPS. I said, oh, we need to teach celestial navigation. And bringing that up, Bowditch, B-O-W-D-I-T-C-H, is the guy who literally wrote the book on celestial navigation. He does not use a chronometer in that. He uses an almanac, but he tells you how to determine the time of day by looking at the stars. Yeah. 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 He, uh, he, uh, is still used uh, in our cl classes for the origin of geometry. And uh, if you're going to figure out 
how to sail from Nanjing to a port in uh, Eastern Africa, and you got latitudes of both. Well, you take the spherical trig and you figure out, you know, part of it, and then you take and have to modify that angle to get the rump line, which is what all sailors use, which is angle everybody everywhere <laughs> at the same direction from uh, true north. And uh, Bodic goes through this long, uh, long method of how you get the rump line from a spherical trig line. Well, <laughs> you don't need any of that. You don't, you can do, do it all, not, don't need straight. You don't. don't. <laughs> just with, just with um, uh, cords and angles, which is clear in the Indian mounds, effigy mounds. And once you try it out, uh, you can follow these alignments from the big horn medicine wheel to the home of the white wolf up in UP 900 miles away. Yep. The other thing is that uh, using Bowditch's celestial navigation method, it, what you see is what you get. You're not looking at the surface of the earth from outside. You're looking at the outside from the surface of the earth. And that's how you measure everything. You don't have to go the other way. And for centuries, the guy who could do the navigation, and this is before chronometers, he was called the chain. He was the chief engineer, and in the U.S. Navy, it's still pronounced the chain. He could look at the stars and use his chain to measure the angles and do so in less than a minute and have your location, have your position on the surface of the earth in less than a minute. I need to get, have you teach me more details of that. That's very interesting. Okay, will do. All right. Well, are you guys, Rick, are you okay to keep going for a little bit? Part two? 15 minutes or so. Okay. So, so uh, talk to us. I want to try to get to the bottom of this because whenever I try to impress a girl or whatever, a guy, friend or whatever, I say this Venus stuff and I say, boy, you want to know why there's stars on our flag? And of course, nobody's ever said that they know why. And I say, oh, well, that's because Venus makes a pentagram over eight years in a rose-shaped pattern. And then after five of those, so that would be 40 years, it returns to the same spot in the sky. Um, I don't know if people think that's cool or not, but can you guys tell me if that's correct? <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. <laughs> Yeah, it's spectacular. We were um, finding special sites up here. Uh, couldn't make any sense about the alignments to the sun. Uh, but they align to the northernmost set of Venus. And that happens every eight years. And when you actually go out and observe it, man, there is Venus as close to the Earth as it ever gets. And when I was going out to the Jeffers Petroglyph site in Minnesota to check out, field check our work, on the, the news was, don't report any more UFOs. It's just Venus as close as it ever gets. And it sets then as far north as it ever does, just like the sun at the summer solstice does. And then it dramatically falls from the sky by, you know, finger widths or, or fist widths a day. And it falls and it's gone. Well, it's dramatic. And anybody who watched the sky would know that that was something that is a good metaphor for something else, something brilliant all of a sudden falling. Uh, then it appears, and this is in uh, the Mexican codices, one of the few that have survived. It's the ephemeris of what we can watch. Then it comes up in the east and uh, rains in the east during the Olympic Games. And so the Greeks all knew when to get together for their Olympic Games and it's part of the Mayan calendar and so forth. 
But yeah, that was um, like sacred geometry. You, it's hard to explain. It relates to the golden ratio. The golden ratio then, uh, if you know how to make that, you can make one degree and all sorts of things and you're out surveying around the world. But of course, uh, during the dark ages, 500 AD, they burned the books in Alexandria and then those who were out watching this phenomenon should be, uh, of course, doing something else. And then we had the propaganda that Venus fell from heaven. Venus was called Lucifer in the days of Jesus. And Venus fell from heaven and is now in hell. And the pentagram is its symbol, pentagon. <laughs> so be careful who you talk to about that. You could get in trouble. I have, the, the Inquisition is no longer uh, officially supported, but there are people who still would like to do what they can. Yeah. Rick, do you want to say something or do you want me to say something? Uh, I will say one thing, uh, and that is that American Stonehenge or Mystery Hill or whatever you choose to call it in Salem, New Hampshire, has stones along its eastern edge that coincide to my notion with rise and set of um, Venus. Now, I don't know why they'd have setting positions on the eastern side, but they are there. And there are eight of them. There's only one good explanation for it, in my opinion. Um, but nobody, to my knowledge, has ever attributed those positions to studying Venus to uh, reset a calendar, which is what a lot of them, Anasabi in particular, their lodges use that method to check her calendar every few generations. Right. And it said that, said that Venus is the most accurate uh, thing we can observe because in eight years, it comes to northernmost set. Whereas if you use the sun, it's only one year. So it's eight times more <laughs> accurate in yeah. time. And of course, uh, yeah, it's, they in Mexico don't know how the Mexican observers set the Venus calendar, part of the Mayan calendar with the sun, but they know they did. And it's a big mystery. It's clear up here in the mountains how to do it. It's in the sky, never changed. Although we, we have proclaimed that Venus is no longer in the sky, or looser is it? In the sky. Right. Yeah. And so, so we believe what we've been told mostly. But just a just a final thing on that. So yeah, the morning star, the evening star, as above, so below. That Venus is basically, you know, it's it's uh, whatever's up there. All of the elements and chemical everything that's up there is also in our bodies and shells and everything grows in that golden ratio as you guys right. have taught me and right. so when when you have jesus in his paintings with his fingers like that up and down you know as above so below what's up there is down here in our bodies and uh i think uh, jim do you have any last thoughts on this and then we'll continue this uh with a whole bunch of other questions next time well you hit the key element, um, Venus, <laughs> there are people during the stupidity of the dark ages and they burned the books and stuff as the work of the pagan uh, people inspired by the devil were left when it was all over with certain things we're supposed to believe. One is that Venus is no, Lucifer is no longer in the sky. <laughs> and, and, uh, but people can get upset when you say we're out watching the fall of Lucifer. No. <laughs> They'll get even more upset if you say you're watching the rise of Lucifer. <laughs> well, it's a great metaphor. And yeah. it, but we were part of the story because they didn't pass out all of our history to us, just parts of it and stuff made up so that we would believe what we're supposed to. All right. Well, guys, Jim, so much fun. Great job, Rick. We have great questions for you next time, Jim. 
Uh, so we are going to see you very soon. And good job today. That was a lot of fun. Well, thanks. Uh, Rick, I want to talk to you about this uh, chain that uh, you were talking about because I'm really, I really need more information on it. So we'll be in touch later. Maybe we can do our own Zoom meeting. All right. That'll work. Yep. I have to go um, take care of some domestic matters right now. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And I'll look forward thank to the guys. next time. Bye, Jim. I'll, I'll set up the next one soon. Thanks, buddy. All right. See you. Bye. Bye, all.